Okay. I think that it's okay to start a little bit early. It looks like everybody that's here um, that is going to be with us is here. So, without any further ado, welcome everybody to the kickoff meeting of the semester. We have a little surprise for you guys. Instead of doing like a workshop or anything, we're going to be doing sort of like an inspirational thing. We want to show you guys everything that we've been up to over um, the break since you guys have last seen us, since we've did our competition in the Among Us tournament. And then um, we hope to see uh, kind of what some of you guys did at the very end. Start off the semester in a nice, um, smooth way. So, um, just give me a moment and I'm going to pull up the slides. One second. All right. Just give me a go that everyone can see this. And, all right. Cool. All right. Show and tell. Exactly what I said. This is everything that we've been up to since you've last seen us. Excuse me for my face being red. My monitor is right in front of me. All right. So, to start, this is kind of a little bit of what I've been up to. So, I don't know if any of you guys remember, but I designed a website for um, uh, myself, for my personal portfolio, and I was actually reached out to by a local business, a restaurant by me. Um, they were opening up in the town over, and they asked me if I would be interested in designing a website for them um, to get started with. So, if anyone's interested in kind of like trying to span out and get involved with any local businesses or small time work or con like software contracting, it all begins with initiative, right? If you don't show everybody that you're capable of doing what you do or have some sort of resume, CV, LinkedIn to show everybody, you know, you're never gonna be able to get your foot in the door until you actually put your foot in the door. So it started off with me kind of talking with these people, trying to convince them that I would be the right person to do everything, right? And something that is kind of not always thought about, but it's it's really crucial if you're going to do something like this, make sure to closely communicate with your employer so that the product is to their desire. I get being a software person, it's really difficult to get out of your own head and understand that the product might not be perfect to their specifications than it is in your head. But ultimately, in the end of the day, it is their product, so you have to really closely communicate with these people to make sure that they get what they like at the end right after i kind of figured out what they wanted i went through the design phase uh, i was sketching in my notebooks which you guys will see in a little bit and i went through a lot of different designs you guys hear this word a lot in cybersecurity and in comp site iteration right you should really be iterating through your designs trying failing succeeding whatever it may be and moving on to the next step or even sometimes, don't be afraid to take everything and just throw it away and start fresh if it's not working, right? It, we tend to get stuck in holes sometimes with design. And the last piece of advice I want to give you guys for designing website, any piece of code, is one of my favorite quotes from Picasso, good artist copy, great artist steal. You have an entire World Wide Web full of all these different websites that you can look directly at their source code to figure out what tricks and techniques they're using, what languages of JavaScript that they're using, right? Look at what these leading people are using and try to get in on it, right? It's really hard to start from fresh with just a textbook and yourself to get modern. Look at what's on the web, right? I was looking at most of the restaurants in NYC and their websites to figure out exactly what would work for the website that I wanted to make for these people. All right, and I'll show that website off a little bit later to anybody. Um, I'll send the link. If anyone's interested, you could let us know at the end. All right, next thing I did, not really coding related. To be honest with you guys, got a little tired of coding. So I started to shift over into another um, couple of fields, right? And this is where I really want to stress something. Embrace any curiosities that you guys have. If you're a creative person, which most programmers and hackers, cybersecurity people are by nature, your ideas are not usually exclusive to just your major and field, and you can think outside of the box and follow your other passions, right? Everything is kind of connected, so the further you kind of follow whatever you're curious about, the stronger your mind will become, the stronger your tool belt will become at the end of the day, right? And take the approach to like inventing and designing that you know Da Vinci pioneered. Everything is connected. All these different fields um, are interdependent. So don't be afraid to kind of cross over. So, you know, this is one example of something that I did. I had seen a coin in my hand and I wanted to see this coin flip from front to back. 
but I wanted to see how I could render this in like a, a 2D cartoon. So I started, you know, taking circles and trying to do the trigonometry to figure out exactly how the angles of the triangles internally of the circle changed when you were changing the angle um, that it was viewed by. A lot of different notes, a lot of different trial and error actually wound up me learning Blender to do. Um, but it's a great exercise, one for mathematics, two for me to be able to um, now start the programming on everything and learn a graphics library in Python. Next is designing a shelf. Totally unrelated, but this is something else that interested me. Um, I saw the idea for like a floating shelf, um, like in a news article, and then I was like, okay, I kind of want to try my hand at that and see how good it would be um, to do myself. So this is kind of my intro to woodworking was first on the left side page was figuring out um, basically everything that was necessary <laughs> so that I didn't rip my wall apart or put a bunch of things and it fall down. Um, and then it came to me just measuring the dimensions and making sure that everything was properly structurally integral and then on the right side you could see a zoomed in view this is where i kind of had a little bit of fun um planning exactly how i wanted it to look so that it was stable but it was also my own design using um some trigonometry and um, dimensions yeah so that was kind of a couple of the things i got up to um this break although they don't seem related they are more related than you think okay and next on we have jill Hey y'all. So my name is Jill and I won't be presenting a project, but I will be talking about a group I'm affiliated with outside of school. And if any girl here wants to become a part of it, they are absolutely welcome to. So as you can see in this slide, this group is called Built by Girls. Now, Built by Girls is a mentorship dedicated to raising the next wave of female tech leaders. Its purpose is to give young girls the tools and guidance they need to navigate these tech careers. Beginning in this field, I didn't really know who to turn to and ask advice from. Before now, none of my friends were in cyberspace, and I knew I could speak to my professors, but personally, I didn't feel comfortable asking them about every single little professional detail. As you guys know, there are just some things you don't want to talk about with your professors. Built by Girls has given me mentors I can reach out to about anything, like prepping for interviews or networking. When it comes to this program, all you have to do is ask for what you need and they'll happily work with you to get there. For example, I'm set to begin a job this fall in cybersecurity governance, but on the side, I'd really like to work on something more freeform like travel videos. Uh, right now, my mentor is a creative strategist at Pinterest and she's connecting me with videographers and making an assignment for me to collaborate with them for Pinterest. Again. All you need to do is ask for help and they'll work with you. And now lastly, if there's anything I've learned from this program, it's that this field, the tech field, requires more than technical skills. And I know for us girls, imposter syndrome really kicks in and we'll think we don't really exactly match up with an internship's requirements or anything in tech and et cetera. But whatever your specialty is, whether it's being analytical, connecting with people, whatever, there's a space for you here. But yeah, if you guys need anything, please message me. Now I'll be throwing it over to Roshni. Hey guys, so my presentation is about soft skills. Um, excuse my doggo. I wanted to think of a picture to like demonstrate like softness and I just thought of my dog, so which I got over break. But anyway, um, <laughs> so building up on that mentorship thing, um, I highly recommend this group called WISIS, Women in Cybersecurity, uh, for cybersecurity majors uh, that are women. Uh, it's been really great, and I'm slowly discovering everything there is with this WISIS group. They had an amazing career fair this past October with top companies, Google, IBM, um, that were straight up reaching out to people via email immediately. So I highly recommend it. Um, but really, over break, uh, I started a mentoring program with them. It's five cyber kids and the mentor, and it's been really amazing just to see students of cybersecurity from other schools, just to kind of see what they're learning, what they have to share, and just collaborating with them that way. So I highly recommend joining WISIS. I think the fee is pretty cheap for uh, students, so I would keep that in mind. Uh, I also started studying for Security Plus way back this past July, but I took a break during the semester. Uh, I used a textbook, and I highly recommend Professor Messer videos and practice tests. So any cybersecurity student, 
you may want to start looking into certifications because there are some entry level ones required for certain careers. So uh, definitely reach out to me for anything like that. And the next potential step might be an AWS cert. I'm taking a cloud security course. So shout out to anyone in my cloud security course. Um, so I may start looking into that after. Uh, and yeah, that was basically kind of what I did over break. And just to transition it over to Nicole, I also worked on a lab with her. So go ahead, Nicole. Okay, so like Roshni said, over the winter break, me and her started working on the foundation for a lab that we hope to put on for you guys later in the semester. So definitely keep a lookout for that. And that is using Metasploitable. So for those unfamiliar, Metasploit is a platform for testing, executing, and exploiting computer systems using a modular framework. So essentially, it's used to create uh, security testing tools, exploit modules, and a penetration testing system in form. And so a module is essentially code that contains an exploit for conducting an attack. And there's different variations of this. Another one called auxiliary that's in the Metasploit repertoire, and that's for performing scanning and information gathering. So essentially passive reconnaissance. Now, Metasploitable itself is actually a virtual machine that's a vulnerable version of Linux, and it's going to be taking the place of your target um, when you perform penetration testing. And traditionally, like we're going to do is use Kali Linux to perform the pen testing on the Metasploitable VM. And in pen testing, for those who may be unfamiliar, there are five main phases, reconnaissance, scanning, gaining access, maintaining access, and then recovering tracks. What's neat about Metasploitable is that it actually can be used at all these levels um, in conjunction with some other applications too to fully flush it out. So some common uses are NMAP or Nessus port scanning to perform some exploitation. So NMAP and Nessus are really powerful tools that because when, let's say if you're working for a client performing pen testing, uh, they may only want you to perform a specific kind of scan and other tools out there may just do it from the beginning to the end, but with NMAP or Nessus, you could actually configure it to look for specific vulnerabilities or even like system types. Uh, and um, Metasploitable is also used for leveraging information gain during these scans to launch exploits. So when it comes to gaining exploit, uh, gaining access, um, there's tools that allow you to escalate privileges, so it'll allow you greater access to the machine. You could also craft custom payloads and plugins to maintain access on the machine. And also, of course, which is most important, removing artifacts and traces so that you, it can't be traced that you even infiltrated. So Metasploit is really great with that. And another neat feature about it too is that it has a database for storing all the information acquired while using these tools during the exploits. So it's just nice and centralized and it's good for maintaining consistency for each engagement that you perform. And so what are the types of exploits that Metasploit can perform? Uh, generally, they're split into two categories, client-side and server-side. So for client-side, these could be browser-based. So let's say in Metasploitable, there's tools that allow you to actually create Java plugins for different browsers, such as like Chrome or Firefox, Internet Explorer. And these plugins can be installed on the target VM and used to take over. It could be something like a remote access Trojan, and you could to further go through the process of pen testing from there, maintaining access, all that. There are also file format exploits that be crafted in uh, Metasploitable. Now these are unique in the fact that they actually take advantage of the installed applications on the VM. So that's why it's so important to have good tools like Nmap that you could actually look out for what's installed. And so let's say if you have Adobe Acrobat, um, there's tools that allow you to exploit the PDF files, Microsoft Word .doc files, so as long as the client has the version of the application that has the vulnerable vulnerability recognized by Metasploit and high enough privileges, the payload will land. There's also standalone attacks, which is where Metasploit allows you to create your own attack and then package it, wrap it up into an executable specific to the operation, your operating system you're targeting. So you're not taking advantage of any particular vulnerability per se, but instead you're conducting like a social engineering attack and you're exploiting the human vulnerability to get them to run your executable on their target, on, on their own client-side VM. And so for service side, um, you could target open ports, as I mentioned with Nmap, and so whatever services are running on it. So for example, if port 80 was open, uh, you could run Nmap, which 
Uh, we'll go into later on how you can even just run the commands on uh, future lab, hopefully. Uh, and it will print out which version of the web server you're running. So in the screenshot here, these are screenshots from printed from Nmap showing the exact attack uh, done. So it was showing that port 80 TCP was open and the version of Apache running was 2.2.8. Uh, this is really great because you could actually then do your own further research on the side to see what are some known vulnerabilities with this version of Apache. Uh, as in the case of the real world, you know, a client that hires you may not even have the most up-to-date patch uh, for Apache, and so there, you could even, you know, do a pen test to see what exact vulnerabilities are for that. There is also firewall uh, exploits that you could use using Metasploit, voice over IP, and IoT devices. So what's great about Metasploit is that they're open source, so their database and repertoire is constantly evolving with new technologies. So there's even, like, um, you know, known things for Amazon Alexa devices, your smart home devices, smart lights. Um, so these are all things that we hope to, you know, show you guys how to use in the future and future labs. And with that, I'll hand it over to Isaac to go over his tool. All right. Hey, guys. I'm Isaac. Um, what I wanted to talk to you guys about today is something I kind of touched upon um, during our last kickoff in the fall semester. Uh, for those of you who were there, you might recall my presentation on Pi-hole, which is setting up a DNS sinkhole on your home network. Today, I want to further kind of go over how else to customize your home network so that, you know, it is essentially your home network. Um, I believe it's a very important topic, especially because in the current situation we find ourselves in, everything today is remote. Um, you guys are working probably from home. You guys are definitely doing school from home. Um, today, although maybe because of the snow, you guys probably had class from home. Um, so everything, as we see, is definitely being done from home and our home network is being exhausted. Everything we do is coming out of our home network. Um, large chunk of our lives today is being hosted online, whether it's through WebEx, Zoom, Microsoft Team, or whichever other platform you're using. Um, everything's online. Right, so our home networks have never been more essential than they are today. What I wanted to speak is how we can further protect ourselves when we are online, um, because we're online so frequently. Um, what I wanted to speak about today is how to further use a Raspberry Pi, if you have one, to kind of go over how to protect yourselves. Last time around, I spoke about setting up a DNS sync code through the application Pi-hole on a Raspberry Pi. To kind of go over that, just for um, if anyone wasn't there, um, real quick, Raspberry Pis are small single board computers that could be as low as $5 and typically highest price of go to is about 75 bucks. Um, but what I was able to do is set up my Raspberry Pi to work as a DNS sinkhole. What that means is that my Raspberry Pi was set up as my DNS server. If I wanted to navigate to a website such as, you know, www.facebook.com, um, that packet would go to my computer, to my router, and then eventually onto the internet. However, the routers don't really interpret www.facebook.com. What it would do is translate that specific URL to its appropriate IP address, and that's how I actually visit the website. Um, having the Pi set up as a DNS server with the sync installed, what I would do, I actually blocked facebook.com and other sites on my DNS sync -hole. So when I would go to facebook.com, Instead of going to the big blue page, I would get a 404 not found error. Not because I completely erased Facebook, um, but because I didn't let my network route me that way. Reason why I'm bringing this up is because it could be used in so many other potential ways. I did that specifically to kind of help me during finals week to block certain um, sites that would be distracting. You could also use it to block adware sites, phishing sites, etc. Um, but Raspberry Pis in general are great additions to home networks, and I encourage everyone to kind of play around with your home network, uh, right. being that, you know, that's some of the hands-on work that you'll be able to get done. So moving on, today, Vinci's still there? There we go. So moving on, what I wanted to talk about today are some of the benefits of further implementing more things onto a, a Raspberry Pi, such as um, setting it up to be a Tor. So for those of you who may not know, Tor is the Onion Router. Um, it's a free software that lets you use the internet anonymously, okay? Um, so it's able to anonymize your web traffic. Many of you probably heard of Tor. Whenever people um, hear about it, they seem to associate it with, you know, accessing the deep web. However, it's much more than that. Um, what Tor routers do is that they route all your web traffic 
through what's called the Tor network, okay? These are a series of random routers, um, and whenever you do send traffic, what it does is that it takes multiple steps before it actually gets to where you want it to get to. Um, usually in a normal internet connection, it's, a, it's much simpler than that. When you send it to your router or modem, it gets sent onto the internet, and there's a few steps involved in that. What Tor will do is kind of obscure that travel it takes. So not necessarily erasing your footsteps, but definitely making them very difficult to trace or track, okay? So um, what Tor, how it actually works is that when you set it up, it consists of adding a three-layer proxy onto the actual device it's on. Um, so there are many layers involved on this, on each specific router. So like I said, definitely a lot of steps to follow if you're tracing these steps. Um, the reason why um, the actual logo is an onion is because of those layers in case you didn't know a little fun fact in there um a lot of you i don't know uh, me for years i saw an onion i was like that's such a weird logo reason being because of the layers so just to reiterate tor is used mainly to anonymize yourself online and to preserve your privacy okay um, as far as the actual setup, it could be done on as little as a Raspberry Pi Zero W um, or a Raspberry Pi 3 or up. reason I kind of um, am naming these specific models is because they have wireless adapters built into them, okay? Other Raspberry Pis, if you have any at home, um, you know, if you have a Raspberry Pi 2 or something like that, you could still use it for this. It's just a matter of getting the appropriate wireless adapter and dongle so that you could emit that wireless transmission. Um, yeah, so... As far as getting the um, Tor program, like I mentioned before, it's completely free. Um, it's Git is online. There's a repository, which I actually have linked down on the bottom. Um, and I also have an easy setup guide on the bottom, too, which we'll share eventually onto the Discord chat if anyone wants to follow those steps. But it's very easy to follow. I believe there's about 20 or so steps to actually install it on your Raspberry Pi. Um, very easy to follow. It's just about typing the right commands in. Um, but some benefits of it, right? For one thing, it helps you anonymize your traffic at home so that you're kind of in charge of your home network, okay? It's kind of giving you that power. I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely into privacy. Nowadays, privacy, complete privacy kind of sounds like a myth. However, setting up something like this um, definitely brings us closer to getting to that benchmark. As far as how it could also help you in terms of a little bit more security, um, potentially not really right now because you know the situation we're going on, but eventually, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to want to travel, you guys are going to stay at a hotel, and it's going to be very tempting to connect to that free Wi-Fi. However, we all know that's not really the best idea. Free Wi-Fis are generally, you know, not secure. You never know what's on them. Um, essentially, what you could do, because a Raspberry Pi essentially fits in the palm of your hand, it's very easy and lightweight. You could carry it anywhere you go. You could potentially just connect um, this Raspberry Pi to whatever free Wi-Fi there is and have that set up as your router. So all of your incoming outgoing traffic is being sent through a Raspberry Pi rather than the free, who knows how secure it is, network, okay? So it's definitely a great thing to kind of um, consider, especially, like I said, if you're into privacy, I definitely recommend, you know, having, if not necessarily a Tor router, um, potentially using a Tor browser whenever you're doing some research or anything of that sort. Um, but yeah, like I said, um, this is essentially intended to let you be in control of your home network. There's many other things you could do, of course. Um, if anyone else has any fun things to do in securing the home network, by all means, I'm open to it. I have many IoT devices in my house, so I'm looking for any ways to keep these things secure. Um, and yeah, um, like I said, with this current remote online world, it's more important than ever to kind of stay secure and private online. And that being said, we're gonna move over to something probably a little bit more fun than that um, with Thomas. So uh, how's it going, everyone? So this is a project that I did, um, you know, just kind of for fun. So I don't know about you guys, but I know I love um, all those retro games, you know, from nostalgic from the childhood, uh, Super Nintendo, NES, Sega Genesis, all that. Um, so they started releasing these things um, a few years ago that are basically uh, Raspberry Pi that's running on, you know, internal storage, like 20 or 30 games, of, like the best hits from that generation. And... So I got one of these, and, you know, the mindset of cybersecurity is always, like, how can you modify things to run um, in a different way than it was intended? So, you know, they're becoming more and more popular. Uh, if you can see the next slide. It has, you know, they, they released, like, a PlayStation one and kind of ones for, like, all those old consoles. So I realized um, they have on the, the back of it, 
the way it's powered is actually over a micro USB. So, you know, with that, you can easily just plug that into the computer instead of just plugging into the wall for power. And you can actually access the file system that's on it. And just by running this program, I found it was able to bypass some of the restrictions that allow you to access the, like, I mean, it's something like 80% that's just completely unused of the internal storage. So then, I mean, you know, by going online, finding the, the ROM files of like pretty much any games from the Super Nintendo, you can just install them onto the device. And now you have like, you know, a fully playable game that you use the original controller and you can play, you know, two player couch co-op. It's a lot of fun. And you can even install other things like, you know, emulators to run GameCube or Game Boy games. Like I installed uh, some old Pokemon titles. So this is a user interface. And you can even put on like, you know, an image from Google Images that uh, it just looks like, you know, an addition onto the, the ones I already have. So I installed like, I mean, probably close to 100 on there because there's so much extra storage. And I mean, you know, it's a, it's a super fun project. I use it all the time. You know, some of me and my roommates play like, you know, two player games on it. And um, yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, I've got like other things on it. It's not even for the Super Nintendo. And you know, depending on what kind of controller you want to use, you could even do that on something like the PlayStation or the NES if you prefer that. But if you're into the retro games and you want to just, like, experience all the old games from your childhood, this is probably, like, the best way to do it. Because, you know, using the discs and the, the cartridges that might be, like, damaged and won't run properly, this is, like, the best way to run all those titles on a virtual library that use the actual original controller instead of having to, you know, pirate it on the computer. So... Um, and then, you know, just in conclusion, um, this is, uh, you know, it's a really fun project. And um, next, I think to kind of build off of this, I want to do something similar where I take a Raspberry Pi and basically run, instead of Super Nintendo, like a GameCube thing on it and install like all those old ones like Super Mario Sunshine and Mario Kart Double Dash and all those. So that's it. All right, guys. So. Yeah, so I'm Faison, and this is a project I started working on during quarantine last year around May. That took me pretty much the, the whole summer to complete. So at the time, uh, I was really interested in learning more about COVID because it was still a new thing at the time and researching more about it. And in the process, I came across a data set containing images of chest x-rays of patients uh, suffering from COVID and viral pneumonia, along with x-rays of people who were in normal condition. Now, the main motive behind the creation of this data set is that in some hospitals and other areas where there, where there are few testing kits, um, it may take a long time or they don't have ways to test people for COVID. And even in the places where there are a lot of testing kits, um, it takes a long time to get your results back. So this makes it very hard to detect and isolate people who actually have the disease. And so I saw with the images of the chest, the chest x-rays, I saw that it was possible to detect instances of COVID and pneumonia in a patient's lungs. So it can be used to screen for people who have COVID very quickly, uh, given that all hospitals have x-ray machines. Now, the thing is, it's very difficult to detect these instances of COVID in the x-rays manually, meaning with the naked eye, it's, di it's very difficult to differentiate it from pneumonia and normal x-rays, and the differences can be very subtle. So this was the motivation behind this project to train a computer to detect uh, the differences. So this project is an application of a field within data science called deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning. Um, wait, Vince, can you actually go back? Uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm sure everyone here has heard about machine learning. Well, deep learning is just a subset of that. So deep learning is something that you know, really fascinates me and the field that I focus on within deep learning is called computer vision, uh, which involves developing techniques to help computers understand the contents of images and videos. So what, for, so what I did for this project is I developed something called a convolutional neural network that can detect COVID and pneumonia much faster and more accurately than top radiologists in detecting instances of the disease in x-rays as they're around 83% accurate. So I want to explain the name convolutional neural network and what it means because it's one of the most disruptive technologies today. All self-driving cars utilize CNNs, 
to gain an understanding of their surroundings. You, uh, all the Teslas you see on the road, all the self-driving cars you see on the road, they all use uh, this same technology. Um, so these CNNs, they're actually inspired by biological neural networks in our brain, which can be modeled mathematically to allow computers to learn in the same way that we do. You know, so scientists today are actually using and developing CNNs to better understand our own brains because that is still a huge mystery. We still don't understand how our brains really operate. And we take a lot of our brain's functions for granted. We still don't know how powerful it actually is. So the techniques used to build high-level CNNs are all derived from the inner workings of our own brains. Now, the word convolution itself is actually a linear algebra operation that allows computers to be able to find patterns in images and learn the differences and learn the features and differences between COVID pneumonia and normal x-rays. Now, if you're wondering how all this works, um, I don't want to get too detailed now because I have a separate meeting planned where I explain computer vision in depth. Uh, but an overview and understanding how this model works is that we have to understand how our vision works. So the way in which we recognize people and places uh, with our eyes is through the signals that flow from our eyes that flow sequentially through our visual cortex um, through multiple stages, right? So at each stage, increasingly complex features of a scene is processed by our brain. So our visual perception is carried out through stages and these stages um, in our visual stream correspond to convolutional layers in a convolutional neural network. So the convolutional layers you see in the picture there, um, they actually um, represent like stages in our visual perception. So um, you can see in, in the picture there, conv1, conv2, conv3, conv4, conv5, those are what allow the model to extract the features that differentiate between COVID x-rays and bio-pneumonia x-rays. Um, so with each convolutional layer, the computer finds patterns and learns to detect the features that correspond to each category of x-ray. Now, the fact that, are, that there are multiple layers in a CNN puts, uh, makes it under the realm of deep learning because there are multiple layers and they can, the networks, these deep neural networks, they get very, they can have dozens of layers. And the model I developed, you can see there has only five convolutional layers. And this reduces a lot of the processing time to train this model because these CNNs actually need to be trained or fed a lot of data in order to become accurate. So you need to show the computer a ton of images for it to be able to find patterns. Um, usually you need to have data sets with over a thousand images so the model can accurately um, detect the differences, but it ended up working for me with around 700 images because this was still a new thing at the time. There weren't that many x-rays available. Um, but usually the more data you have, the more accurate your model becomes. So it takes time to train these models. It took my computer around 30 minutes to fully train this model to reach 93% accuracy. And that, uh, I'm pretty fortunate because my laptop has an NVIDIA GPU. And if you have a gaming PC or anything that has an NVIDIA GPU, it's going to be, um, be able to train these models a lot faster because Believe it or not, these GPUs are made for things like deep learning to, to um, handle uh, highly complex like computational uh, programs. So deep learning, like I said, is the same technology that powers self-driving cars. It recommends you products on Amazon. It allows you to have conversations with Siri, and it can detect cancer with a higher level, with higher accuracy than any doctor. So um, Vince, can you go to the next slide? So. Um, so just recently, uh, last week, I made a web app where you can upload a singular image. And using the model I developed, it predicts if the patient has COVID, pneumonia, or is normal. So um, Vince, if you can play the video. So you upload an image. And the code for this is all available. And um, you can see there that the model predicted that the patient has COVID. And what it does is that it shows you the probability of the patient uh, having pneumonia or is normal as well. And so what you're seeing there is the areas the model uh, deemed important, the areas that the model thinks that um, affect the classification of the x-ray, meaning that those are what corresponds to the model's prediction. And we can see that those areas highlighted in the lungs are what classify the image as COVID, you know? 
the idea is that you would be able to show this to actual radiologists to confirm their importance and to get their input on it. But um, yeah, all this code is available on my GitHub and you can run it yourself. Um, so Vince, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so. Yeah, so this project, um, it actually started off as something I wanted to do for fun, you know, um, just to learn about deep learning and how it works. And but I ended up uh, writing a research paper on this project, which got published in um, ACM's newest journal just last month. So I actually reached out to Professor Keshkar for his input on this project at first. And, um, and with his help, I was able to improve the program and write a paper on it. So, you know, in the paper, I went, uh, I, I um, talked about um, the whole process of how I trained the model, my findings, and the whole methodology behind it. And, you know, this is definitely like my biggest achievement because, you know, I talked about convolutional neural networks, but I had zero idea what that meant before starting this project. I had no prior experience with it. Um, you know, before starting this project, I saw that linear algebra and statistics were imperative to understand, to really uh, understand like how to actually do this. But, you know, I still haven't taken linear algebra and I finished this whole paper before even taking statistics last semester. So what I'm really trying to say is that you can learn everything about everything online for free. And I want to emphasize the word free because I, you know, I never paid for a course on deep learning or anything related to it. I literally just looked up tutorials on how to get started and watched YouTube videos on it. And, you know, and I don't want to undermine the fact that uh, I was pretty much just coding like day and night. You know, this was during lockdown. I had nothing else to do. So this is what I um, forced myself to do. Um, but yeah, so uh, I was able to finish this whole project around the course of three to four months from when I started to, I guess, when I finished this paper. And, you know, all it takes is dedication, you know. If I was capable of doing this, then, you know, all of you are, are as well. And Vince, can you go to the next slide? So um, the bigger idea here, I guess, with this whole presentation is that personal projects are a must and they're a way to directly showcase your skills. You know, what makes computer science and cybersecurity different than other majors is that we have the ability to make things, whether that be software or hardware, we have the ability to create things that people can actually interact with and use, which can benefit them in several ways, you know? So they, they show the capacity to which you understand certain topics. You know, the project that I just showed, it shows you my understanding of deep learning. So um, any project you worked on shows that you're skilled in that area. And, you know, I stress personal projects a lot because um, to, uh, I wouldn't have been able to get my internship for this summer without doing them. You know, I was, I was explicitly asked three times in interviews for the same internship about the projects I've worked on and how I can improve them. You know, if I don't have any projects, if you don't have any projects, I highly doubt you'll be able to land an offer. And that's just the reality, you know, based on my experience, these companies want to see that you work on things outside of class and are proactive in doing things on your own. And, you know, I have a separate meeting plan where I go more in depth on interview tips and um, how to answer interview questions effectively. But um, uh, so for inspiration for projects, I highly suggest you visit the GitHub for uh, SETA and check out all the projects we have there. All the code is there for you to see. You know, I put in a lot of effort and time in creating and organizing everything you see there and providing a lot of links. Um, to additional resources and videos along with explaining how to run the code. And, you know, these are high level projects, you know, um, they're pretty advanced. Um, they're a way to show you the capabilities of computer science and, you know, all the amazing things you can do with it. Because most of the things we learn in class are theory based. We don't get to see how it's actually applied in the real world. You know, so I, I think all these projects are a way to show you that, you know, um, in the machine learning applications, Repository actually have a program there that shows you how to develop a model to detect breast cancer with 97% accuracy and about 25 lines of code. So definitely go check that out. Um, so yeah, next slide. Um, so the, the next thing I want to say is that um, these are just some general tips for moving forward. Um, the first thing is to just reach out to us. You know, everyone here on, on the eboard has relevant experience in our fields and we can definitely help you guys out with a lot of things. 
is, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. You know, all my classes are asynchronous, so, you know, my social interaction is pretty limited. So, you know, I'll be glad to um, help anyone out with, you know, whatever they need. And the next step is to reach out to professors and ask if they have um, research opportunities available. You know, if you're unable to get an internship, this is a great alternative that can, this is an alternative that can be just as great and as an internship, you know, because it helps you gain experience. It's something you can put on your resume and, you know, be proud of. And something that people don't know is that a lot of professors are actually either required or encouraged to do research and publish papers and, you know, if you can help them with that, that's a win-win situation. You know, you get experience and, you know, they get to publish. And um, this gets me to my last point is that you have to figure out how to learn. You have to learn how to learn. And what I mean by this is that you have to figure out how you learn best and what methods work for you. You know, if I'm trying to learn something, say, I'm ch say I want to learn how to build an app. Uh, for instance, I'm going to go ahead and dive straight into building the app and looking at resources online and how to do it. You know, I personally, I learn as I go and I learn especially from mistakes. I'm not going to read a book on how to build an app because that's not how I learn. Um, maybe it's how you learn, but I think everyone learns best when they actively apply their knowledge. And, you know, I didn't read a book on how to create a convolutional neural network. I literally just dug straight into the code and learn how to do it like that but um yeah that's all i have well thank you guys i think that was a great way to end the presentation and last slide now it's your turn for any audience members that have anything that they want to share whether it be um through audio or even if you want to uh, screen share and show us some of your things that you've been up to you're more than welcome to um show off anything that you got so I'm going to leave it open to um, basically some questions right now for any of the presenters. If you have any personal questions or you want to see anything more in depth or if you want to show off any of your own things, um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and invite you guys to uh, participate. Well, if there's, if none of you guys want to, hold on, call out anything. Yeah, please. This is also a time for questions. If you want to see anything more in depth, um, this would be the time to kind of uh, ask questions, or if you're just curious about something. I just wanted to say that uh, I'm also happened to be studying for the Security Plus exam. And when you mentioned about when you talked about Professor Messer's security videos, um, I just I really like that because he's been helping me out a lot too. <laughs> Get the practice tests; like they're not super expensive and they're really good. And just to make a comment on that too, for anyone else studying for the Security Plus. Um, Reddit's a great resource too. There's a lot of websites with free practice questions. Um, that's how I got my practice questions in. Um, yes, I got a book and yes, I read it, but the main studying is, you know, preparing for how these questions are thrown at you. So definitely look them up on Reddit. Yeah, hit me up for any resources if you need it. I can like direct you, direct you to like the links and stuff. And, um... Just to answer Holly's question that she put in the chat, I want to get better at coding. Are there any resources you recommend? Um, I Two personal resources, like um, Faizan mentioned. Faizan did a great job um, kind of curating our GitHub, so I'm going to go ahead and put that overall in the chat. This matches up right with our YouTube channel, with our SATA YouTube channel. So there are a lot of introductory projects for you guys, which I link right there that you can go ahead and check out step-by-step step how to get these introductory projects done for Java and for Python. And then you can even head over to the GitHub repository uh, in the description. Um, and there you have the code that you can look at and run yourself, right? Um, besides that, anyone else, you know, no, new to coding or, um, you know, maybe have lost their way. It, it, it's like everything, right? I can't force you to play basketball if you don't like playing basketball. You're never gonna be good at it if you don't like playing the sport. You have to find some sort of niche 
that you enjoy in it, right? Whether it's gaming, you know, creating a social media app, creating a website, find your shtick, and that's what you'll learn through. You have to have your passion kind of fuel you to even want to learn in the first place, or else it's just going to be miserable. All right, no problem. And now, before we kind of um, wrap things up, um, to all of our, just a quick announcement, to all of our CTF prize winners, if any of you guys are here, we will be sending you guys out an email shortly explaining why things have been a little bit overdue. We apologize, but um, expect this to be dealt with within the next week or two weeks. I'm going to have everything shipped out to you. Um, furthermore, right, we have one other thing that we're going to ask you to do is we have um, a survey that, um, Jill, if you don't mind sending out, we have a survey kind of talking about what days and times work best for you guys and maybe some things that you're interested in. Um, give that a quick fill out. It's only about two questions, if you don't mind, to kind of help us better gauge the, um, the audience and how we can do things for you guys. And um, right now, there is a ACM event. Um, if anyone knows what ACM is, Faison mentioned it. It's um, American American uh, uh, no Association for uh, Computing and Machinery. So um, this is a huge uh, organization that does most of the computer science and engineering um, in America. They do a lot of publishing. Um, we are now a chapter of ACM, right? So SGU SATA is a New York chapter. We are through St. John's. Um, and I just sent over an event that is free. Normally, to join ACM, it's about $20 for membership for the year. Um, we now have it because of COVID that it's totally free membership, and you'll be able to join SATA if you'd like. So stay tuned to that. We're just working on getting the correct code and everything. Um, you can have a free membership. We'll talk more about that and send you guys emails. Um, last, last thing, after you're done filling out the survey and anything. If any of you guys are interested in participating in SATA, this year, next year, for the coming years, becoming a board member, getting involved, please stay after and uh, talk to us for a little bit, right? We would, we're would we not really looking for any seniors right now, um, to be fair. Um, so if you're any uh, junior or underclassman, feel free to stay um, with us and we could talk for a moment. And yes, we'll also be playing a little bit of a game with everybody else who has a little bit of time to kill with us. So with that... Thank you, everybody that showed out to our first meeting. We thought this is more of an inspirational thing. Uh, we will get back to the normal workshops and uh, presentations for all you uh, tech nerds out there. Uh, for now, try to check out all the YouTube videos if you haven't. And um, yeah, thank you guys for joining us, and we will see you next time.